Hello, and welcome to the live stream, uh, Guild Wars 2. I am narrative designer Scott McGough. To my right is lead writer Bobby Stein, and to his right is narrative designer Angel McCoy. Happy Valentine's Day to all you Guild Wars 2 fans out there. Today we're here to discuss the new character, Timey. Bobby? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> actually, we'll start off a little bit about the character's genesis. Um, it was something that... Uh, you know, early last year when we were talking about what we were going to do in the first season of the Living World, when it was still mostly a conceptual idea, um, you know, the three of us got together and discussed a lot of ideas. Angel was basically part of almost every single Living World release, and, uh, you know, she was a big part about, uh, big part of what characters we came up with and, and how they were introduced. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Maybe if you have a couple minutes to fill people in on the origins you of the bet, character. You bet, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Timey was one of our original characters that we, uh, when we were designing the um, the main set of characters for the Living World, Timey was one of them. It just took us a, a little bit longer to actually introduce her and get her involved in the story because we wanted to focus first on Rox and Bram and Marjorie and Casimir and get them really well established before we brought Timey in. Uh, because we knew that Timey was going to be sort of the, um, not the salt in the wound, that makes it sound awful, but she's sort of the, she's sort of the monkey wrench in the system of the, of the group, and the, so she's going to come in and change the dynamics. The there we go, yes, <laughs> the the, becomes the pearl, yes, <laughs> indeed. Becomes the, becomes the oyster, yes. <laughs> yes, the grit that becomes the oyster. Eaten. You know what yeah. I mean, yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> so, um, so we... We did a lot of thought about Timey early on, and there was a there was a whole lot of discussion about her because she is a child. She's 13 years old. Uh, she is making a 13 year old a main character. Actually, has some repercussions um, with regard to the ESRB. Uh, we certainly did not want to throw Timey into combat because she is 13 years old. Uh, the ESRB sort of frowns on endangering children, putting them in, in battle situations. Our solution to that was to give her Scruffy, her golem. And Scruffy is specifically designed for whenever Timey is in danger, she can hunker down inside him and be safe if it's really a dangerous situation uh, and Scruffy doesn't even feel like he can keep fighting and keeping up with things, then Scruffy will hunker down and, and become a bunker for Timey. So she is always safe, um, even though she goes out on these adventures into these dangerous situations with the other four characters and, and you, the player. And if I can add something there, we established sure. in the Edge of the Mists map, Scruffy has a lot of defensive <coughs> capabilities. He has a lot of protocols and parameters for if Timey's in trouble, he will protect her. If that means fighting, if that means hunkering down, if that means removing her from the dangerous situation, that's what Scruffy will do. That's one of his main functions as Timey's Golem. Mm -hmm. So, sorry to interrupt, but please continue. No, that's fine. Um, do we want to go with the first question, or? At what age does a progeny become an adult? That's a good question. Um, it varies from case to case, just like human beings on Earth. There's different mm -hmm. maturity levels. You can look at a 17-year-old who's not very mature, and you can debate whether or not that person's an adult. Timey is, as she describes herself, a progeny prodigy. So she is advanced. Um, she's much more uh, intellectually advanced than a lot of her peers, and she likes to truck with the adults as if she's one of them. But I think the short yeah. answer to your question is sometime around adolescence, uh, Timey is right on the cusp of becoming an adult. It remains to be seen when she'll finish that journey and make the transition from progeny to adult. Mm -hmm. A lot of it depends entirely on uh, the education process as well. Um, Asura tend to track a progeny's success based on where they are in their education. Um, you know, some will move through that much faster than others. Some will move through slower and, and may not have, you know, all of the social responsibilities and things that, that someone who's shown themselves to be more intelligent and responsible uh, can have. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of her character from the narrative design standpoint, but also kind of maybe hint at some things we want to do with her? You guys want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, obviously the Living World releases, we had many of them throughout 2013, and, you know, we're uh, starting the year off where Timey made her introduction. But there was a lot of, uh, 
you know, background development that went on behind the scenes um, where maybe her initial concepts uh, in terms of, you know, everything from her personality to what she would look like kind of evolved as we started uh, focusing more a little bit on the uh, core narrative of the first season. So um, mm -hmm. why don't, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of maybe some of the changes that happened behind the scenes? Uh, with Timey? Yeah. Yeah, Timey... Um, so, we didn't start out with a really clear idea of what we wanted Timey's personality to be like. And so, when we actually started writing for her, uh, it, it, was, it was as much an uh, exercise in discovery for us as it was for her, uh, primarily because we wanted her to play off the other characters. And so, uh, almost immediately, we, we attached her to Bram, and that was not something that was originally in the concept. Um, it, just, it just made sense that she would become most attached emotionally to the character that was the closest to herself in age. Uh, furthermore, they have this relationship that um, is kind of sassy. You know, he doesn't he doesn't let her push him around. Um, he doesn't let her get away with tantrums, and yet he obviously sort of takes care of her and and you know guides her. Especially in the edge of the mist map when he is. He's been assigned to take care of Timmy and to see her home safely. Uh, it wasn't his first choice, as we saw in the scenes. It was sort of a surprise to him. Timmy pretended to know him and sort of maneuvered him into being the guy who would take her home. But I agree with Angel. I think uh, Timmy settled on the be iconic yeah. our character Bram, who is the closest to her in age and I would say in maturity level. Not that Bram is yeah. a child, but Bram is still very much that 17-year-old on the edge of becoming mm -hmm. a full-fledged adult Norn. He's very concerned with his mm -hmm. legend. Uh, he's very honor-bound. And so what started as a duty for Bram, after spending time with Timmy in the Mist, they forged an actual relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is, I think, one of the opportunities where we have, uh, you know, a lot of the, the recurring themes with Norn are you know, forging your legend and doing, you know, great and heroic things. Um, Watching a child is not necessarily the first thing that you think of in terms of I'm going to be a big strong hero and, and you know save the world kind of thing, but I think it actually is a bit more powerful than going back to the uh, the same well of I'm just going to go out and hit a big thing until it stops moving. I mean he's basically taken on the responsibility of this young child and it's he's basically going to do anything he can to protect her, and we're going to see you know, both characters actually develop through this relationship and the things that they're going through. And I think, uh, yeah, it's not like he actually wanted to, to, to be <laughs> a, uh, a nanny or anything, yeah. but uh, you know, he, he took up the responsibility and uh, he basically took it seriously and followed her mm -hmm. into the mist, you know, into the yeah. edge of the Yeah, because he's a good guy. Yep. Yeah. And we've seen how Bram interacts with rocks, and they toy with each other and tease, with, tease each other a little bit. We saw a taste of that in the Queen's Jubilee release. So mm -hmm. Bram is used to dealing with uh, sassy ladies who can take as good as they get. And mm -hmm. so Timey is another case of that. Uh, Timey is a lot sharper and quicker mentally than Bram is because she's an Asura, because she is an advanced prodigy. And that negates a lot of the advantage his size and relative maturity gives him over her. So I, uh, when I was writing a lot of the scenes for Timmy and Bram in The Edge of the Mists, I found their interplay, I won't say it wrote itself, but they, it, their, t their pairing lent themselves to a lot of good uh, scenes. The dynamic between them is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, Bram being a stand-up guy who also doesn't take a lot of guff. Uh, being partnered with this tiny, very sharp little girl who gives guff out left and right. So you see them, as the scenes progress in Edge of the Mist, you see them kind of find a common ground, where Timey starts off lecturing Bram about, well, here's the advanced things I've learned about Scarlet's machinery, and then Bram demonstrating, now I understand what you're saying, I can put this in different terms, more naturalistic terms, in terms of animals, mm -hmm. in terms of weather. I may not have the Asura vocabulary or the techno babble that Timey has has been throwing at him, but he does have an understanding of what the, the things Timey is trying to show him. And as Timey comes mm -hmm. to understand that, I think she developed a new kind of respect for Bram. Mm -hmm. Initially, he was just a vehicle to get her away from Logan, but they did forge an actual relationship, and I think now they're actually much tighter uh, than mm -hmm. they were at the very start. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to say about, the, we introduced Timey later, we knew we had two strong pairings in Bram and Rox, who got together and met each other in Flame and Frost, and Marjorie and Casimir, 
who were a team before we met them, but we see their partnership develop as we go through the living world. Uh, Timey introduces a natural kind of storytelling friction. We had two strong pairings, and then we combined those two pairs into a larger team that was finally starting to cohere. And then we throw in this sort of monkey wrench where Timey comes in and mm -hmm. she's not got the quite the same kind of personality and not the same kind of relationship that would naturally blend well with the two existing pairings we had. And that makes often for good storytelling, especially when you have strong characters to throw at each other and let mm -hmm. them bounce off each other. Yeah, and I think in, uh, in January we kind of first started seeing a little bit of the strains on the, the friendship between Bram and Rox, and now having Timey thrown into the mix, I think it's going to, uh, you know, introduce some new possibilities for, uh, you know, character dynamics. Mm -hmm. We've got some questions, comments on the board here. This one is from Lysis. I hope I'm saying that correctly. It says, Sniff Snaff would be proud of Timey. I tend to agree. Uh, Snaff was very proud of Zoja, but Snaff was also not entirely comfortable with Zoja's level of sharpness and snark. Zoja was always a mm -hmm. lot meaner than Snaff was. And as we've seen, Timey can be sharp, and Timey can take you off at the knees without you even realizing she's, she's attacking you. <laughs> True. Uh, but as we saw, Timey does have a softer side, as we saw with Bram. So I agree. Yeah, Snaff, Snaff, Timey would have been a great apprentice for Bram. Oh, sorry, I, I saw Bram on the screen. Timey would be a great apprentice for Snaff, and we're going we're gonna to delve into Timey's relationship with Zoja further down the road, and I think that's going to be a facet. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things Zoja sees in Timey is a lot of the same potential Snaff saw in her. And so there's this sort of generational mm -hmm. thing where Zoja is trying to continue Snaff's work and do things as well as Snaff did. Mm -hmm. I also think personality-wise that um, between, between Taimi and Zoja, that um, in, the, in the long run what we're going to see is that um, Taimi brings personality to that relationship between the two of them that Snaff brought to his relationship with Zoja. So, in many ways, Timey is going to temper Zoja in the way that Snaff tempered Zoja and kind of kept her under control. Um, now, they are going to potentially not be together forever. There are story elements coming up that uh, I'm not going to tell you about, but that um, will put some drama there between Timey and Zoja. And so you can look forward to that. Do, do you guys want to talk a little bit about... Um a little bit more just about uh, her character, like her, condi her condition that was revealed in this yeah. last release. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, so, Timey has a degenerative uh, bone condition. We're not going to put a name on it. We're not going to, certainly not going to put a real world name on it. Uh, heaven, heaven knows that there are plenty of different options out there in the real world for what it could be. But um, because of this, Timey is imperfect. And Timey has had to work hard to overcome this imperfection. Um, her legs don't work very well. She, when she walks outside, outside or off her golem, she walks very slowly and she has a, a bad limp. Um, so she, she can't really go very far. Most of the time she rides on her golem or she rides inside him and that's how she gets around. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to why we decided to do that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to let you answer that because sure. this was your idea. This was initially, yeah, I had the inspiration for this idea. When we were behind the scenes developing Timey and we spoke to the art team, once again, a really strong collaboration between narrative design and art and eventually design for what, mm -hmm. how Timey was going to appear in game. We talked about this, uh, Angel had spoken recently, just before, about she's 13 years old, so we can't literally throw her into combat as we would an adult. We came up with the idea of, this, of the golem being her way that she can participate in combat or avoid combat or successfully win combat. So the art team, they had an, a model for Timey. They gave us a model for the golem. And at the time we were deciding what to do with Timey, at the time that Timey's character was really coming together for us in our meetings, they only had the one model for Timey, which was of Timey sitting on her golem shoulders. And the plan, that, the plan then was to, for them to press on and eventually make a golem for Timey to stand alone. But since we knew she was going to be in a combat situation, the first thing they did for us was Timey with her golem. Mm -hmm. And I had the idea, this is not a limitation, this is actually a character facet. What if Timey can't get around too well without the golem? She needs the golem. It's not that just she needs the golem to fight. She needs the golem to be as mobile as the other characters. And so we sort of took that idea. I presented that idea to Bobby and Angel. We batted it around. We ran with it. 
and we decided this really informs the character, gives us a nice hook for future conflict for the character, and it gives the character a real foundation of she's not just a prodigy who's good at school. There's this, impl this shows that she had to put a lot of effort into this. She had something to overcome. It gives her a past. Um, every great character has a past where they're coming from and a direction they're going to. And this degenerative disease gives us both of those in one fell swoop. Uh, and it also expands the diversity of our cast. Uh, growing up, when I was in elementary school, one of my best friends walked with a leg brace. And his condition was such that they told him by the time he was done growing, he would have the leg brace off. But that friend of mine, Jimmy B, he had a leg brace the entire time I knew him, and it was never a factor in our friendship. He was friends with other kids, he was friends with me, and Jim B, if you're out there, one of the toughest kids in school. You did not mess with Jimmy B, leg brace or no leg brace. And so that's, Tommy's not like that. Tommy's not a, Tommy's not a scrapper the way my friend was when I was a kid. But the notion that the, the handicap does not define this person. The handicap, the disability is a part of who this person is and they factor it into their daily lives and they get around and they rise above it and they work just just like all of us work with. If I take off my glasses, I can't see very well. So I have to manage that. That's a disability, that's a handicap I have. Um, but that doesn't make me any different than Timey or, or, or than my friend Jim B back when I was in second grade. Go Jim. <laughs> Do you want to talk about uh, where Tommy's name? Uh, yeah, so we have a question uh, from The Million. Uh, he or she asks, where does the name Timey come from? So uh, I'm going to preface this by saying that um, quite often in the game, we choose names for characters uh, based on the meaning of the word, the meaning of the name, um, the historical sort of underpinning of the name. Uh, that is not the case with Timey, I'm sorry. Uh, we, well, I, I should say, chose the name Timey for a very specific reason. I have a friend, had a friend, uh, who was 96 years old when I met her. Uh, she and I sort of bonded and she told me many, many wonderful stories. She was very smart. She was a small woman, very tiny, and um, she died when she was 98, uh, about a year six months to a year before we first started designing the, the cast of characters. And so I chose the name Timey for her because um, I wanted to both honor my friend, but also because I saw so many aspects of my friend in her. And when Timey is, is a, a little elderly woman, I want her to be like my friend, who, who was just sharp as a whip and had all these stories to tell and was just amazing to sit and listen to. Well, it looks like we got another question that came in from uh, Waterseer. Will yes. there be any further exploration on her degenerative condition? Is she doing any research on it? Mm -hmm. Are there any collaborators she is working with on this condition? It would be very satisfying as a player to help her in this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll take those in order. Will there be further... Mm -hmm further exploration on her degenerative condition. Absolutely, it's a facet of Timey's character. It has the potential to become even more debilitating. Uh, as, we, as she states in Edge of the Mists, there's a possibility that this condition will spread to the rest of her body. She might lose the use of her arms, etc. So this is something that's very con uh, a serious concern for Timey and she's going to be looking into it and trying to figure out how she can arrest this disease's project progress and possibly even reverse it. And if not, how is she gonna, do, how is she gonna handle it going forward? In terms of collaborators, we haven't identified who that person might be, but absolutely, once Timey is able to dedicate some time and some effort into looking into the causes and the prevention of the spread of her disease, she's gonna re recruit and look for the best uh, advisors and collaborators she can get. One of the other things I wanna add to that is, um, you know, any opportunities that we have with our characters to not only have the player interact with them, but also give the player an opportunity to help um, be a motivator of change or just kind of taking the lead on um, improving a situation. Uh, it really is a great opportunity to come up with some really strong content. And I know uh, yep. lately we've been having some really amazing uh, discussions with uh, folks on the design team and the art team as to, you know, we're, we're getting to know a lot of these characters in our story instances, uh, but Related to that, we're trying to find ways for the character to actually uh, spend more time with the player outside of just pure conversation, but you know, get get the player and these characters kind of involved in the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the fact is, the player mm -hmm. is very important to the world of Tyrion. You are the hero of Shamor and the humans. You are the slayer of Isormir for the mm -hmm. Norn. 
the player is at the center of most of the important things that happen in Tyria, almost by definition, because the player is the one playing the game. So certainly Tami will turn to the player for advice and input when it comes time to look into her condition. And mm -hmm. we would, I know, speaking for myself and I think for Angel and Bobby, we would love to have that be a piece of content mm -hmm. where that's the focus of what the player is doing. We need to find out how to fix Timey or how to arrest Timey's degeneration so it doesn't get any worse. Mm -hmm. And there's a question up now that says um, several newcomers to the live stream are asking, who is Timey? Um, tongue in cheek now, I think you're in the wrong place because this is the Timey discussion. But that said, the answer is <laughs> Timey is our newest be iconic. Uh, she's the one of our main characters who features in the NPC group that adventures through the living world, which includes Marjorie and Casimir and Bram and Rox. We just introduced a tiny Asura child of the age 13. She's an advanced student, as she likes to say, I'm a progeny prodigy. Uh, so Timey is the new Asura member of our adventuring group that's been participating in the living world content so far. Mm -hmm. All right, do uh, and yeah. This is Timey right behind us. Ain't she cute? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we had introduced her. The players at first actually spent some time uh, either fighting alongside her or getting a chance to see her interactions with uh, Bram and um, Logan mm -hmm. um, in January. And uh, also, the uh, players got a chance to help her out in the Edge of the Mist in this most recent release. And this is, these are not the, the only times you will see her, so you know, expect to mm -hmm. get to know her a little bit better and see her story mm -hmm. progress. Um, let's actually take a minute to talk... Um, Let's see, about the casting process. One of the things that we always face every time we mm -hmm. bring a new character into the uh, story of Guild Wars, um, we always have to figure out who would, what actor, what, what sort of voice are we going for? You know, what, what sort of tone and delivery? Uh, how do we want to personify this, this character concept? And, um, you know, going back a few months, I think this probably stretched into... Well, for starters, we had actually considered uh, having Timey debut in November, but once we kind of firmed up plans for, you know, how we were going to end the year and then eventually end the, um, the, the Scarlet arc, uh, we decided, let, let's hold off on that, let's focus on a few different things, and then we'll, we'll introduce her a little bit later. So January became uh, the time. Um, you know, who do we want? To do her voice, and you know, in the past in Guild Wars 2, when we had had uh, child characters, you know, if you're exploring the world of Tyria, you'll encounter a lot of children. Uh, we have some really awesome, awesome child actors who had done the children in our game. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there was the debate over whether or not we should find another child uh, to voice her, or if we should go with an adult, somebody with a little bit more of a stable voice. So we actually got a number of auditions um, that. Uh, we're all very good. Um, we decided on Debbie for a number of reasons. I think she, she and that's, really... Sorry, Debbie Derryberry is the actress who Debbie plays Debbie Derryberry. Yeah. She, she, the funny thing is uh, her audition sounds almost identical to the voice that she gives in-game. And I think when we, when we heard it, we all liked it a lot. There was some de debate over whether or not we wanted to go with her or, or another actress. But, uh, you know, thankfully, I think uh, we, we decided to go with Debbie and we have not regretted it one, one no. bit. And during the, I've only, I've only been in most of the voice sessions for time. I haven't been in all of them, but Debbie brings a real energy and a real understanding of the character. I mean, she walked through the door mm -hmm. and she knew she had a really strong idea of what we were shooting for. And then once we gave her the quick character pitch on Timey and how we wanted to use her and how we wanted her to come across, Debbie was right there. I mean, in a matter of minutes, Debbie had the character nailed. And then we put we gave her words to say, and she said them just brilliantly. Um, we're very, mm -hmm. very happy with the choice. Yeah, of every voice. session with her has just been a joy. Uh, she she really brings Timey to life, which is which is amazing. Our our big concern was that she wouldn't be able to sort of maintain a child voice, but but she's totally believable. Uh, in our opinion, as Timey, we we love her and you know hope to keep using her for a very long time. So it looks like one of the viewers had a question: Has anyone asked about Timey being related to Omad? We've actually seen a number of different theories about what her relationship is. <laughs> you know, a lot of the the characters that we've introduced in the Living World uh, have some sort of connection to the existing iconic characters. You know, uh, Bram is Air's son, and and. Uh, we'll learn more about some of the other character uh, relationships, whether they're based on bloodline or, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of connecting event. Uh, we're actually not really ready to talk uh, that much about 
old-timey's backstory or relationships. We want those to play out in time uh, through the game mm -hmm. so that people can experience it organically. Uh, and also, it'll be, you know, played out uh, for the highest, I don't know, story impact. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, perhaps you will get an answer to that question in time, but uh, unfortunately, that time is not now. <laughs> Next question on the board. Will we get to see any character development between Rox and Timey? I think that's a definite yes. yes. Uh, Timey is going to interact with all of our other adventuring characters who have been involved in the living world. And mm -hmm. we're going to see how her relationship with each and every one of those individually and as a group evolves. So short answer, absolutely. We are going to see more character development between Rox and Timey. And if I... Spec if I can speculate just a little bit, they have Bram in common. They're both sort of partnered up with Bram in different ways, and I can see that leading to either friction or, worse for Bram, if they gang up on him. <laughs> so true. And then, is Scruffy, based on the designs of Flummox, later sold to Zoja's Mr. Sparkles? Uh, I'm not too clear on who Flummox's is, but I know Timey's Gollum is her own design. Uh, she's very proud of him. She put him together all by herself. Yeah. Uh, she built him from the pieces she could scrounge, beg, borrow, or steal. It's very um, attached to Timey. It's an expression of her artistic and her scientific and her magical ability. It's a very <laughs> characteristic thing. It's, in a way, it's like her favorite shirt that she sewed herself. I made this and I use it every day. So it's not strictly based on anyone else's designs. It's a totally unique thing that Timey did for herself. Yep. Uh, so Veteran Oakhart asks, can Timey repair Mox? Um, you know, it's not really high on her priority list at the moment. So um, whether she can or not, maybe. She is very, very clever mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, working with golems, building golems. Like, like Scott just said, she built Scruffy from scratch herself from uh, salvaged parts and things that she found around uh, in her in her own little secret lab that she has and um, she maybe could repair Mox if she wanted to and could find yeah. him and yeah I think it's a question yeah. of <laughs> Interests, opportunity, and resources. If Timey has all three of those things, then sure, I think she would take a crack at repairing Mox. She would definitely take a crack, yeah. yeah just if, for the bragging rights she... to say, I fixed this thing when nobody else could. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, the process with the art team, kind of how we, uh, you know, as a, as a group, kind of figured out her, her look? I think we kind of covered that, but what yeah. do you mean? Yeah, it was just uh, kind of, I think, the evolution of her look. I know there were a couple of different um, phases of her concepting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our mm -hmm. team is really awesome. We can, you know, get in a room with them, give them kind of the high-level overview of any of the characters mm -hmm. that we're trying to introduce. Okay. And then usually yeah. they can uh, kind of go off and they'll be like, all right, you know, we'll get back to you in a couple of days. And usually it's, yeah. you know, we get this really wonderful bit of art and then from there we can go and say, yeah, you thanks. know. Yeah, I think speak speaking for myself, um, Whenever we get something back from the art team, I'm always mightily impressed. I think it always looks great. Um, we often offer tweaks, suggestions. Can we refine this so that it fits our purposes more? But I've never seen a character model or an idea that came out of the art team that didn't strike me as visually spectacular. And yeah. one of the things I liked about Timey, the way, we were, the way Angel had initially presented the character and the way we were presenting her was not especially tomboyish, but not super feminine either. Yeah. She was kind of straddling that fine line. And when we saw the art, and Timey does have a very cute, very feminine set of features and makeup, and I sort of like the, um, I guess, the, the dichotomy between the, she looks like a sweet, innocent little girl, mm -hmm. but that's not really her character at all. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a sweet person. She mm -hmm. is innocent, mm -hmm. but she is not the flowers and sunshine sort of pushover girly girl yeah. you might expect uh, as, a, as a cliched fantasy character. Yeah. Timmy's got a lot more grit than that, and I think her very feminine that's appearance true. kind of belies that, which I like. Yeah, I like that too, actually. And that's one of the things that uh, that I got when we first saw this artwork was um, I realized that you know Timmy. Because she is something of a little manipulator, she manipulates adults to do what she wants to do, and so she, she knows how to play the cute, right? She knows how to work the cute to get what she wants. And, and so it, it suddenly made sense to me that she would have this little cutesy outfit and the little froof on her head, and you know, she, she's definitely 
going to work whatever tools she has to to get where she wants to be because that's that's who she is. Yeah, I definitely want to give a shout out to. I know uh, uh, Scott had uh, you know given a shout out to the um, the art team. You know, definitely I think with the concept artists and the character artists, they had done a really good job of bringing mm -hmm. her to life. But honestly, um, you know between the writing of her character and the implementation of getting her into these different situations, you know, in the story instances and then also like in Edge of the Mist and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a really great effort to see people from, you know, both Living World teams, um, you know, the designers who implemented uh, her into the content. Um, you got a mm -hmm. chance to really see her in a, in a number of different situations and just, I mean, everything from, you know, Link implementing the banter in Edge of the Mist. or like uh, use. yep. Yeah. And um, I know Lisa Davis worked with you pretty closely on the uh, mm -hmm. January story instance and stuff. She so, did. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was just, I think this, is, like for the people who have been noticing a bit of a change in, you know, the, the quality or the outward, you know, facing uh, presentation of the living world story and the characterization that we're trying to do, um, it's only going to get better over time because we're really stressing um, a lot of partnerships internally with the people who can take it from concept to completion. So, you know, we're, we're connected to all these people, but we're all building uh, toward the same goal, which is, you know, great gameplay and great story and really interesting characters and just a beautiful world to explore. So, you know, I just definitely want to say that there's a lot of people involved in, in bringing these characters to life. And uh, it's just been, I think this has been a really good run through where we've actually introduced a character more like the way that we've kind of envisioned in, in our heads. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's incredibly rewarding as a storyteller when things come together as well as they have for Timey. Mm -hmm. uh, the character concept, the look of the character, the way the character moves, our animators have done some special stuff with Timey. Uh, oh yeah, the transition jumping yeah, in. The way yeah, the timing jumping in and out of her golem. Mm -hmm. uh, the voice actress's performance uh, it, it tells us we did at least our foundational work properly when people get interested enough in the character to invest a lot of their creative and technical talents to make yeah. her even more appealing and to make the impact she achieves even better. Uh, I think we saw that in Edge of the Mist. Like you said, Link managed to script those scenes. Um, the way the way she interacted with people during the marionettes, the way she yeah. talked to Logan and Bram, that's yeah, I, uh, I don't want to embarrass Angel, but that whole exchange where <laughs> Timey and Logan, Timey is literally running rings around Logan. Logan is trying to be the disciplinarian, and she's accusing him of talking like a four-year-old, and she snaps at him, and then she completely buffaloes him and, and convinces him that she knows <laughs> Bram. Uh, that, that sort of stuff takes everybody in ArenaNet, everybody who's working on the release, pulling in the same direction to make it come together, and I think it came together beautifully. Yeah, that also kind of uh, Logan you know, being, you know, intersecting with the living world story and trying to see some of that dynamic. I must feel bad for the guy because yeah. he's getting steamrolled, but we actually have some interesting ideas for what we can do with Logan to also not make him a punching bag. So um, <laughs> He may always be a punching bag no, to timey, no. though. No. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> to well, timey. To timey, every, to timey. Yeah, everyone's a punching bag. Everybody's but. a punching bag, yes. Um, was there anything else that you folks wanted to kind of talk about? I don't know. Were there any other questions? Okay. <laughs> All right, then. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. I, on behalf Thanks. of Bobby and Angel, we were really thrilled to have this chance to talk about Timey and give you a little bit more of her background. And we look forward to showing you what we have in mind for Timey in the future. Yeah, and if you guys have any uh, you know, feedback about the Living World story or you know, Timey in particular in this case, mm -hmm. um, you know, we check the forums, we check Reddit. We um, do. You know, if there's any more creepy photo bombing threads, I'd love to check those out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for playing and for uh, for tuning in. Yes. And happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. We love you, Timey. <laughs>